There is nothing I love more than being with someone who challenges in a loving way the way that I think about something. And there is nothing I love more than being with somebody who shows up authentically and says what is true. And today I got both of my favorite things in my conversation with Dr. Jamie Merrick. She describes herself as a facilitator of transformation. She is an MGI approved trainer and consultant. She's the founder of the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, and she is a social justice advocate. Today, Jamie and I dive into what dissociation means and what it does not mean. And we invite you to think about your own relationship with dissociation and the way that you think about your work with clients. Let's discuss. Today on the Zero Disturbance podcast, we are honored to be with Dr. Jamie Merrick. And I have to tell you, I was I was reading over your bio and I wasn't sure how to introduce you because you just do all the things. I mean, you are a trainer for Andrea, you are, you know, you write books, you do workshops. I mean, you you just have so many things that you do to provide education and transformation for people around not just, you know, receiving mental health services, but also understanding how to think about the frameworks that we use clinically. And so I'm just, I'm very excited to get to talk with you today. I, I was feeling like a, a tenderness coming up to the office because, mm-hmm. you know, you aren't just someone who's teaching us, but you're also, you really have a really clear position about social justice. And just, there's just so many things that you're doing that I'm just so, I'm rooting for you and all the things that you're doing. So I'm just, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here and see where this conversation is going to go. Yes, me too. Well, you, you do so many things. You've done so many things for the mental health community. What are you most kind of passionate and excited about these days? What's got your interest? Honestly, it's advocacy. I think that's always been a part of my heart and it continues to grow in intensity. The more I think the field is calling for advocacy. The more our country in the U.S., the more our world is calling for advocacy. And a lot of the work I do is because I I am privileged to have this more public platform. And I've also been somebody who has really not been afraid to be candid about my own journey. And and I want to respect that people are at different places with that. And I don't think being so out and so transparent is necessarily a requirement to be a good advocate. But since the beginning of my journey, I've just never felt like I've had much to hide Mm. because the whole reason I got into this field is because I had quite a story with my own addiction and my mental health struggles. And it really can piss me off when I'm around other clinicians who either aren't owning up to theirs or really seem to be lacking a compassion for what people go through in our world, especially uh, with what brings them to our offices and, and can really lack a compassion and an understanding of how hard it is to just be in this world today. It could be hard to be in this world today as a person of privilege, let alone if you're part of some type of marginalized group or if you identify in a way that um, continues to other you. <laughs> Uh, for me, that has included my own mental illness. Um, you know, it's included being bisexual. So I just, just feel this, this need to be vocal. Um, cause I don't think the world is going to be helped by our silence. I mean, that's, a f- one of my favorite quotes from Audre Lorde, whose work impacted me greatly, that your silence will not protect you. Mm. And it won't protect me and it won't protect the people we work with either, especially in a country and in a lot of places in the world that uh, is inhospitable and downright hateful to people who you know, don't fit the mold of what I used to call the mainstream, but really kind of the ruling classes. So Yes, yes. And I, I think that one of the things, and I'm just getting to meet you today in real life, but I, I honestly... <laughs> reading your work and and listening to you for years. And one of the things I think that I respect about you and and really just is so palpable about you is that you're not just delivering clinical content to people or you're not just talking about social justice. You you have this vulnerability and this strength in, in saying what's true 
for, for others and for you. And it's contagious. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have to tell you that you doing that, um, as hard as that must be for as long as you've done it definitely has inspired me to share more, be more vulnerable and almost now just, it just it has, has like internalized as mm -hmm. part of this is the way that we do things. And I think that's really needed and refreshing because there's mm -hmm. so many other spaces that tells us not to do that. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And, and even as we're talking, I'm, I'm connecting the dots because I know when it, when it comes to vulnerability, as I've already said, it, it's, it, it's kind of like coming out of any kind of closet, not until you're ready. And I, I don't want to force people like you all have to be as out and as candid as I am. And I know in some areas of the mental health field, people can look at me skeptically for, you know, oh, she shares too much, you know, or where are the boundaries? And it's like, trust me, I've well worked out the boundary piece with my therapist and my sponsor, and I don't share every little thing. Yeah. But I think the reason I feel so passionate about being authentic with where I'm at is the experience I have had in this field in graduate school first. I literally went running from my first PhD program I was in because I was so just activated by the way I heard professors in that program talking about people and the people we were going to serve. Kind of like, do you know who you're talking to here? Like, I'm one of these people, quote unquote. And then even being around conferences, even in the EMDR community. And I, I have to say this, where I think for a lot of my first years in that community, especially, I went to the conferences and sat there feeling like I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. because I have, and it's not to say other people didn't have a story too, but I think that's what bothered me is I sensed they did have a story, but it was like, it, it was so guarded or I'm here in the role of a professional now. And I, I, I've just had this sense of the more I'm able to break down the us versus them barrier and encourage clinicians to really see ourselves as people who are on this change and transformation process too. And let's be honest about it. Let's stop trying to impress each other with our <laughs> prowess around the protocol and all of this. And can we just be people with each other? And uh, the more I've done that, the more I have felt at home and amongst other professionals, because I think the people who, who know we find each other and right. uh, maybe we can inspire some slow change or rapid change with, with others who might be skeptical of, mm -hmm. of people who lead with lived experience. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think that when, when we say what's true for, for what we're seeing, what's happening in us, when something's not landing and we're not feeling seen for us to be able to say that um, it is contagious. And I think we need that type of leadership in our field. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's something really comforting about it. it. It feels very comforting. And I know that, you know, we all have different first encounters with our you know, uh, mentors, supervisors, EMDR consultants that are going to kind of tell us how to be uh -huh. <laughs> as clinicians or, or tell us what the community does or doesn't do. And um, I think it's so important for there to be other invitations uh, in terms of what the culture could be and, and what it means to show up as, an, as a clinician and, and um, what it means to be a person. It's, it's just uh, to have a relationship with what we're teaching, have a relationship with other people. It's so important. So I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> Excellent. I'm here for it. Absolutely. Well, one of the things I appreciate about you too, Jamie, is that you, you have a way of, and I'm going to say this lovingly, you have a way of inviting people in a safe way to zoom out and kind of look at the way they understand something. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, you and I have been talking a little bit offline and I feel like you're on this, this mission to help people do that around dissociation mm -hmm. because, and, and I'll share this and I'm sure you've heard this before and it's probably happened to you, but that word has so many connotations, associations attached to it. And yes. I, I'm excited that you are on this mission to help people think about this word in a different way. One of the chapters in my upcoming book is called Dissociation is Not a Dirty Word. Mm. It's not. It's, uh, e yes. And I, I think 
this was one of my initial kind of concerns coming around EMDR circles. And this was as somebody who was diagnosed with my dissociative disorder in 2004, although it was not new to 2004. It had been a part of my life since childhood. There's evidence looking back. I just didn't have a name for it, right? And then I had an issue with addiction. And as soon as I got into my own recovery and some abstinence, that's when the dissociative behavior started Mm-hmm. escalating even further because uh, for the years I was in active addiction, those were the dissociative behaviors. And I was so blessed and fortunate to have the opportunity to meet an EMDR therapist in 2004 who accurately diagnosed me and did EMDR in a way where she was not afraid of dissociation. Wow. And she gave me a DES like almost any other EMDR therapist would do, yet it was such an experience and here's how we can be constructive about working with this. And it's no wonder your brain ended up this way based on everything you went through. So, I mean, so much of what I want to offer people is that is allow for a reality where they can have an experience like I had with that therapist mm. uh, who, who was just, and, and knowing what I know now, she did technically sound EMDR. But it was in a very adaptive, meet a person where they're at in their humanity type of way. And I was one, at the time my um, diagnosis was DDNOS, Dissociative Disorder NOS, with the new diagnostic criteria of DSM-5. I've gone back and forth on how it translates, but it really is OSDD type 1 or otherwise specified Dissociative Disorder type 1. I do have a pretty defined system that is still in place. I have a lot of the traits of DID, um, only I've, I've stayed very co-conscious as an adult. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a little bit about where I am diagnostically yet. When that was offered to me, it just helped my world make so much more sense of what and why I struggled in the world of what and why allowed me to thrive in the world. Because I have a brain that that really works this way. And many of us, because in recent years, especially, I've gotten more directly involved with a very vibrant dissociation community of people with DID and DDNOS. And for a lot of us, there is this belief that our dissociative gifts are a superpower. Yep. That yes, they could be a disability at times, for sure. And a lot of what healing and treatment has been about is, is learning how to navigate and manage and heal what's underneath that. Yet most of us would not change the way our brains are for anything, Um, partially because it's how we've just gotten used to being in the world, but we're able to see the gifts that, that it has brought about. So being a person whose, whose recovery experience has gotten me more and more enthusiastic about having a dissociative mind, I've obviously been more and more on a quest to get people to look at what dissociation really is, Mm -hmm. and especially to try to neutralize a lot of this scaremongering that I can hear trainers within and without of the EMDR community kind of put out there around dissociation. Because I get it. If you don't have an understanding of dissociation, especially your own, it's a big part of what I teach, yeah, a lot of dissociative expressions are going to be scary. And there can be this fear that I'm going to do more harm than good. So I want to acknowledge and honor that while also giving you the invitation that if you let yourself be with that fear Mm -hmm. and explore where it's coming from in you, that may be the beginning of a beautiful journey for helping you to understand your own relationship with dissociation with intense affect that will ultimately help you better serve the people you work with. Mm -hmm. That's, That's so beautifully said. And that really is the invitation. (laughs) I mean, ideally of being a clinician, right? Is that we're going to work with clients and we can't understand yet or we can't um, relate yet and to be invited to look at ourselves and and just to, and like, like you said, meet them where they are. You can probably speak more to this in terms of, you know, the fear around dissociation with clinicians, but you know, when I was coming up, it was, don't let your client dissociate during EMDR. And it was, and it was like, <laughs> yeah, don't let them do that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. am, am I supposed to uh, mm-hmm. control that? And also, is that yeah. bad? Like it was hammered, mm-hmm. you know? Yes. Um, so what you're saying is exciting to me. 
And I'm here to tell you, newsflash, especially to any trainer or any consultant who may be listening to this, many of us, I would go as far as to say most everyone, if not everyone I've met with a dissociative disorder, we can process in a light degree of dissociation. In fact, it's the only way many of us can. And I want to be clear. Yes. If a person is so dissociated, they're not hanging out with what's going on. Yeah. You have a point there, but even if it happens, it's not like it's the worst thing in the world because how you handle it can show a person then how you can deal with that when that comes up in life. And then you could go back and do some kind of archeology span on, okay, what happened to cause that significant of a dissociative response and how can we kind of approach this work differently next time? Or maybe it'll just be different next time because we kind of got this out of the way. You know, dissociation is not a dirty word. It's not the, the be all and end all, but you know, it's, it's so fascinating to me how I, I listened to a, a previous episode you did with Tom Zimmerman, who's one of my colleagues and, and works with Institute for Creative Mindfulness. And, you know, he's, he is very much an advocate and a pioneer with what he's doing with, with floor blanks. And he may disagree with this, but I've taken this up with him before that I think really what's going on in, in his version of Flash and floor blanks is it is a form of adaptive constructive dissociation. Oh, so and even <laughs> and even as people hear that, they're like, you know, but how can a person really process? You know, and he's really asserting that people are processing in four blanks. How can a person process if they're dissociating from something? We can, yep. because we have to get through this misinformation that dissociation is always a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And how I break it down, I have a new book coming out uh, in January 2023 called Dissociation Made Simple. It's the next in my Made Simple series. And I really intone Dr. Shapiro's language of adaptive, maladaptive, and neutral, if as it were, if we're looking at neutral, in helping us better understand dissociation. There is some dissociation that is adaptive. Yes. There is some dissociation that is definitely maladaptive, especially if it as puts us in a position to harm ourselves further or, or cause others harm. And there's some dissociation that's, that's kind of neutral. It, it just is, in, depending on the context. And for a lot of us, what is adaptive in one context may be maladaptive in another context. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know one of the first ways that was explained to me was my first 12-step recovery sponsor in getting to know me. And she was a cool person who was trauma informed before the term was even in wide use. Right. And she was understanding a little bit of my childhood. And I was explaining to her like what a voracious daydreamer I was Mm. and how living in these worlds I created in my head was the way I coped with how things happened at home. And she's like, and that kept you alive as a child. Yeah. Yet in a lot of ways, it has backfired on you as an adult because it became very difficult to live in the reality that was in front of my face that now as an adult, I was being expected to interact with. And so a lot of the work that she did with me and my first DMDR therapist did with me is how can we still leverage my imagination and my tendency to daydream for the good while also recognizing where it can get in the way of my life. So I, I think this, this term, you know, adaptive maladaptive applies very well here. And that if a lot of us dissociate adaptively over a long enough period of time, I think you can do some processing depending on kind of what you're using it for. And I think for a lot of us that happens with the arts, Mm. that the arts may initially be our way that we kind of, you know, sever because all dissociation means is to sever or to separate Mm -hmm. that the arts can be our way that we sever from the reality of what we're dealing with. It can be the way we sever from that intensity in our body, but through engaging in some art process, we might actually be able to process. Mm. Wow. So, wow. I'm sitting here appreciating just your your honesty, your vulnerability. I'm noticing the timeliness of this conversation as well because um, I still see a handful of clients and, you know, two and a half years of COVID, we've all been traumatized. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and the conversations have been, how do we cope through this? And we've been talking about 
separating <laughs> and how we right. how we separate in an adaptive way knowing mm-hmm. that we're in a pandemic and there's some things we can control about the trauma and some things we can't and so what a timely conversation for clinicians to understand that they might have a client coming in with dissociation from childhood and they might have a client doing it now and, and sure. maybe they should be doing that now Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was the most awesome meme swirling around Facebook saying, some of you lack the dissociative skills to survive the apocalypse, and it shows. The superpower. And, yeah, and I, and I know it's a laugh, but I remember at the beginning of all of this, my operations director at the time was like, you were built for times like these. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I will say this. Yes, she was right in that. Uh, my my tendency to kind of dissociate when I need to, one of my parts is very much the get shit done type of part and confront for the rest of us when we're all miserable. And yeah, she's the one who shows up and she's the one who is why I jumped into high gear at the beginning of the pandemic and kind of got a lot of advocacy things in place and things switched over. Now, the thing with the system is when one part does that, so strongly, there's going to be some energetic fallout later <laughs> with some of the other parts. So I really have had to learn an even better, deeper level of caring for and nourishing myself through this. Sure. And it's not been, I've not been the perfect poster child of how to do that. And on top of everything that's happened in the last two and a half years, for example, I just decided to move at the beginning part of this year. It was one of those, I'm still in Ohio and it's fundamentally a good move to a really cooler space where I can run my home and business out of and I've fallen in love. And that was a lot of what has been the impetus behind the move. Uh, yet it's, (laughs) thank you. Yet it's like, you really needed to do this on (laughs) top on top of everything else. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting back knowing that a lot of the nourishment skills I've learned for myself have allowed me to get through this. But I've also had to be honest, and I have a wonderful therapist currently who helps me with this, at just how much I'm still going through right now, because there's the pandemic and there's just other things happening in life and in business. And yeah, so I guess all of that to say, I'm grateful, grateful for my therapist, number one. I'm grateful for people in my life who I can talk to very openly mm-hmm. about having a dissociative experience of life, a dissociative system, who, um, where I could say things like this, mm-hmm. like I'm talking to you right now. And even some of your listeners may be like, ooh, you know, it, it works for us. It it works for us to be able to talk in these terms, to be able to kind of frame our life in these terms and recognize that um, we all dissociate. Yes. We all have parts. And the more effectively we as professionals can see how it shows up in our life, Mm -hmm. the less scary it becomes in our office. I'm I'm here for the mission. support it. And I think what you're doing can be applied to so many different content areas about just Mm. people. (laughs) Yes. Right. And yeah. And what I'm feeling curious about as I'm listening to you is how, how has it been for you to be a leader in the mental health community to say what has been true for you? What is true for you? How has that been received? (sighs) overall positive from people who have expressed sentiment to me. You know, I I know there's people who are not a fan of what I'm doing. Very few people say it to my face. If they don't like what I'm doing, it only gets back to me through, which is, you know, that's, that's their right. Cause God knows there's a lot of people who I don't agree with what they're doing (laughs) in the field. So what makes this all worth it for me is when another professional, especially can come up to me. And it meant so much when you said it at the beginning of this interview saying your inspiration has helped me to feel like I can be a little more vulnerable about what's happening with me. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, at the Emdria conference in 2019, uh, I was shocked 
that Emdria accepted my proposal to really just share my coming out story as a conference presentation. Of course, I did my official objectives and references and all of that that I needed for a conference presentation, but it was essentially me discussing being what it was like to be out as a woman with a dissociative disorder in this field. And you know, during the question and answer period, there was there was one individual who was obviously not a big fan of what I was doing. And I handled their question slash comment as best I could. Uh, and then afterwards, though, what really spoke to me was, yes, there were a lot of people that came up, especially one individual who said, my team sees your team. Mm. And you know, clinicians could just have such a hang up about talking about their parts, you know, and I'm glad that a lot of the newer models and therapies have tried to normalize it a bit more because that that's my dream is, is to see that continue to happen. But take it back years before, this was probably 2014, when I was still kind of dipping my toe in the water about coming out as having a dissociative mind and a dissociative diagnosis. And I was just doing kind of a trauma 101 course uh, when I was doing general CE. And I always try to kind of feel out the audience to see how much I could get away with in terms of disclosure. And that audience felt like I could share a little bit more than usual. And after the presentation, uh, I, I always remember this moment, a clinician came up and said, I cannot believe a presenter was that open about her own dissociation. She was positive about it. It wasn't, you know, a slam. Uh, yet it was just, I never thought I would live to see this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I really want to inspire that kind of work in people. I want to inspire people to be less afraid. That's a lot of what I jumped into at the beginning of the pandemic, trying to provide resources for doing online EMDR and helping people be not so afraid mm. of making this adaptation. Because if anything, being a dissociative and being, I mean, we're all dissociative people, but having a dissociative diagnosis and living life this way has really taught me how to adapt, especially in a state of recovery, um, that it's like adapt or sink, you know, adapt, which is like swimming or, or sink. And I just had this sense at the beginning of the pandemic that we needed to adapt as a field or we were going to sink here. So I know within the first few days of lockdown, I gathered some friends who'd been doing EMDR online and we got a workshop going and we put just different resources out there, some for free, some for charge, just to really get people, yes, you can do this. Mm. Uh, because I, I think what our field has done to people, but it's a reflection of what our society has done to people is unless I know exactly what to do, <laughs> then I'm not going to be able to proceed and do it. Yes. And I say this when I do trainings, especially on dissociation. I'm not the kind of trainer who's going to tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Thank you for saying that. Say more, please. <laughs> because yes, there are trainings out there that really kind of market themselves as treat dissociation in 10 easy steps or do this, do that. First, you need to do that. Here's a protocol for this and a protocol for that. And yeah, you know... I, and I, I'm not opposed, and I want to be clear to say I'm not opposed to learning technique. I mean, when I do EMDR basic training, I am really clear about we learn standard protocol well. But the reason we do that is so that we we have a solid basis in our technique so that when we're put in these life situations, we know what we need to adapt from. Mm -hmm. One of my yoga trainers always used to say, and I loved this teaching, that you have to learn the rules so that you can break them elegantly when you need to. Mm. But if you don't learn the rules, you'll just come across as amateur. So mm. I'm all about learning technique, but I think then a big part of that is learning the people you serve. Yeah. So, so much of my approach to training or consulting on special topics is let's just learn about dissociation. Let's just learn about addiction, spiritual abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Then we can put in some of the EMDR details later. Yeah. But really the key to adaptability is knowing who you're working with. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible because people are not scripted for me to give you an exact script on how to work with this population. Yeah. Because you need to know the generals of that population. You, you, you must understand the generals of the techniques you're working with. 
But then a lot of it is just that that perfect marriage of clinical judgment, meeting people where they're at, having an attunement to where they're coming from culturally, to what's going on in the times. And it it relies on or it requires you to be a really present mindful therapist to do that. Yes. An embodied therapist to do that. And I know that that kind of flies in the face of a lot of what the field and society teaches us, which is you don't know what you're doing. So here, buy this program. I could teach you exactly what to do. This, I know you don't. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So just, that's just my, my, my two cents on it. And it's um, probably formed by the idea that to really help me heal, I've needed a whole village of people to work with me. Yeah. Good EMDR therapists, good somatic therapists, good yoga teachers. I had an amazing martial arts teacher who was a big foundational part of my healing journey. And we got it. We got to learn to work with it all, but that requires us to navigate it all. So Mm. that's something I can teach you some of the basics of how to begin doing that. But you got to be, I say this and I've rambled. So let me put it together with a metaphor. I tell my students this, that you can learn how to get under the hood of a car and learn every little thing about the mechanics and the batteries and the sockets and this, that, and the other, but that's not going to make you a better driver. Mm. Getting in the car and navigating roads is going to make you a better driver. And to do that, yes, you have to have a basic understanding of the mechanics. Like this is a wheel. This is a transmission. If the brake light goes on, hey, I better address something. Yet having so much mastery of the car without actually getting in there and driving is not going to do you or anybody else any good. Beautifully said. And if I might add also, you know, I've noticed... I think we're talking about fear today, a large part of it, but I have noticed that a lot of my teachers have kind of given me fear Mm -hmm. (laughs) around doing it wrong or hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had a magic wand, I would want to see more consultants and trainers, even people outside the EMDR community. If you're going to be mentoring someone, allowing them to figuring out how to trust themselves Right. And, and, and the role of the teacher in that is not to scare them. It's to help them feel like they're capable. They can figure this out. I've, I'm mm-hmm. here. I've got you. And I get the sense talking with you. And now that I've got to meet some of your friends and faculty on the podcast, that you all share that value. It's just, it's just something that's inside of you. Yeah. And I think a lot of that fear can come from this place of, a legitimate place of we don't want to harm people. We don't want to be held liable or responsible for something, especially with the way the world is. Mm -hmm. Yet I've also seen, and almost anybody who works with me would say this too, fear can be at such a level where it chokes you from being effective. Yes. And it causes you to withhold appropriate treatment to people. And even when I have consultees discuss their hesitancy about moving into reprocessing and and there's a fear around it. I'm always clear to ask, is it your fear or is it the client's fear? Mm. You know, there's this fear around, you know, I don't want to harm them. What if they commit suicide? I've had consultees say that to me before. And I have usually explored, I always explore it. And nine times out of 10, it comes down to I know I had a client commit suicide or die by suicide or attempt suicide before, or I want in the case of one consultee, I had this real abusive psychiatrist I worked under who was like, don't do anything too deep because they may kill themselves. They may kill. And it was just such a, and so I literally ordered her to get some EMDR around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Use the, the very thing that we're working with here to help you diffuse discharge some of the fears that may keep you in fear mm-hmm. about moving forward with, with clients. Mm-hmm. And maybe one of the reasons I'm so kind of brazen is I've had so much EMDR myself. Yes, doesn't it? It makes us <laughs> really? I'm like, I'm just going to oh, say. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it absolutely makes you a better EMDR therapist. Uh, if, if you have that, I, I often cite the first EMDR therapist who I talked about 
really as my original trainer, my original teacher, even though I took basic training, she, she gave me so much of what I needed in my initial understanding. And then, uh, you know, over the years, I kind of had some spot check EMDR as I needed it. And then in 2016, when I went through a really bad period in my own life, I got back in with a steady EMDR therapist who I, I still see intermittently. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just been imperative to my continued growth and being able to do this work and to be able to address those fears that come up. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope everyone watching or listening will understand you have an EMDR therapist. I have an EMDR therapist. Mm-hmm. Like we all, we all need to do that work to, to take care of ourselves and to be mm-hmm. who we want to be. I am curious because you are on this mission around helping people understand dissociation, having them mm-hmm. work with it in themselves, work with their clients in a way that is less shaming and and more nuanced than we've all uh, been taught. If you had a magic wand, <laughs> mm. what would you want to see happen around this area? What would it look like for other trainers or consultants around this? Ooh. Well, if I really had a magic wand, I would want to make compulsory EMDR therapy personally a requirement before coming into EMDR training. <laughs> Or to have it as part of the certification process, if you're if you're going you know, towards that higher level, and uh, of course, I strongly recommend it of anybody who works with me. So yeah, that, that's. But I, I think a, a bigger magic wand. Oh, gee, there's several magic wands I have. I, I would love to see the EMDR community, like the leaders and teachers and trainers, and it not take themselves so seriously <laughs> about a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've I've written a little bit about that and. I mean, overall, to have this view of, as as we're speaking about dissociation so much today, to not be so afraid of it mm-hmm. and to really check yourself on, okay, these things you teach about dissociation, like no EMDR if the DES is over 30, like where's that coming from? Is that I think something- just made it up. I mean- Like I you were taught, you know, and was, and was ingrained into you and- I, I don't know. I, I think if I had to summarize it, and this is also something I've written and spoken about, I am a very qualitatively minded person. I, my doctorate was in a qualitative methodology. And um, even the work I did in dissociation made simple. The book that's coming out, we did qualitative inquiry mm-hmm. of the people that we interviewed, which is tell us more about the how and the richness of your lived experience. And to realize that, yes, So much of what the EMDR community has fallen prey, I mean, I I don't want to say fallen prey because we've needed this to legitimize ourselves in the mainstream, in the medical mainstream, is this kind of push towards empirical research, empirical research, have a number, have a model, have a this, have a that. And um, that can stifle us in a lot of ways. It can keep us from getting to know and work with the person who's sitting right in front of us. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason we can be so afraid of doing that as clinicians is the fear of having done that own work ourselves. So that's why I think if my biggest magic wand would be that we all did, and not just the little bit of work you get to do in training, but we all get to do some kind of deep introspective process, preferably with EMDR, if we're going to be EMDR therapists, but maybe with with other modalities as well. So I I love it. I love that. That was a couple. That was a couple magic wands. We have (laughs) unlimited magic wands. Yay! (laughs) We're we're just dreaming together. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm noticing in this conversation so many things, but one thing that feels like thematic as as I'm interpreting the conversation is this idea of fear, but also safety, Mm -hmm. right? And and how we have this idea of what feels safe to us and, and what doesn't. And I've shared that I feel safe knowing that you are someone who is a leader in the mental health community, in the EMDR community, who is vulnerable, transparent, here to help us think about how to think differently Mm -hmm. about something that's really important. Do you have a sense of kind of what it is for people that, that feel fearful of you talking like this? Like, like, do you have a sense of what it is that makes them feel unsafe, that they're clinging to some other kind of safety? It's a fear. I mean, it goes back to fear. Fear of, and I've written it as a phobia of feeling. Mm. 
and a phobia of it really being exposed. Like who, who really likes to feel exposed without safeguards truly. Uh, but, but I think so much of it really comes down to this notion that if we are honest about what we're feeling and feel it honestly and candidly, we will die mm. or we will be exterminated somehow. And I think for many of us, especially those of us outspoken women, it's the recognition that our grandmothers probably did mm. from stuffing it in or maybe having spoken up and being punished somehow for doing it. And I, I think there's, you know, just so much gender messaging too around men not being able to feel or yeah. you're somehow weak or incompetent if you let yourself show feeling. And the longer I've done this work, I'm convinced it's not our feelings that cause us problems. It's everything we do to try to keep from feeling them that causes the problems. And it's this fear that if we let ourselves feel, we're going to somehow be annihilated. And that's a legitimate fear because a lot of us were raised with messages like that. So let's unpack it. Let's, let's do our best to heal that. Because if I can offer another very crude metaphor, <laughs> trying to hold your feelings in is like trying to stop the flow of diarrhea or urine. <laughs> The need to feel is that biologically necessary. <sighs> and yeah, you're going to hurt yourself if you keep trying to hold it in. Mm. And think of how good it feels when you finally let it out. But then imagine that biological necessity being programmed with so many messages, a lot of them being religious, a lot of them being cultural, that, that you're defective for even having this need to expel. Mm. It is a powerful metaphor because we can all somatically remember the feeling and, and mm -hmm. relate. And, you know, my, my hope is, and maybe you can speak more to this. My hope is that the, the younger generations, the future generations of clinicians in, in, in the EMDR community too, will help all of us get there in terms of culture change in terms of normalizing the things that you're saying will help us kind of, it will be the norm or it will be the majority that, you know, feeling the feelings and doing the trauma work and doing the EMDR, like all the things that you're magic wanding will be part of our community's culture. I hope so. Me too. I hope so. Cause it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a paradigm shift that scares a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, to look at a lot of the reactionary policy that's happening in the U.S. right now to change. I know so many of us are lamenting like, oh, we're going back, we're going back. That's how scary this idea mm -hmm. of being real and authentic and vulnerable is to so much of the powerful establishment, which relies on us holding it in. Yes. Yes. So find your people who are there to support you <laughs> through this, this experience. Uh, we're recording this right now, just a few days after the news of Roe versus Wade being reversed was announced. And all weekend I've been connecting in community with people in my circle who just need to scream about it and who can recognize that there's a lot of feeling coming up here and we have action we need to take. But let's start by holding space for each other about what we're feeling and not shaming each other for feeling it. I, I still am pretty speechless about what's happened. Uh -huh. And I think I'm still trying to find solutions in myself and in the community. But I know that I hope that people will understand that there are safe spaces to be with like-minded people like you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. With Institute for Creative Mindfulness, because you're so clear <laughs> about what you stand for mm -hmm. and, and what your faculty stand for and what your institution stands for. And I don't know what's happening for you on the inside, but from the outside, it looks like you are just fearlessly mm -hmm. saying like, oh, hell no, <laughs> or hell yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, and there's yeah. something also that's, 
comforting about that because I think that people want to learn content and they want to learn clinical mm-hmm. content. But I think mm-hmm. more importantly now, people need to know who shares their values. Right. And it's been an interesting journey for me because I, this might be a subject for another interview, but I did grow up very religious. I had two very religious parents and two very different expressions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of evangelical steeping. I had a lot of Catholic steeping. I have a brother who's a priest. So Mm -hmm. I even began at the beginning parts of my career still being in that world quite a bit. And I did some work in pro-life ministry. And yet even at the time I knew this isn't right. Yeah. Like this isn't me. And a lot of it is I was still in the closet about my sexuality too, but I had to do that to preserve everything I I knew. And so for a lot of years in this world and doing clinical work, I've tried to see myself as a bridge between people, you know, who maybe are coming from a more religious conservative background who've been trained as clinicians to people who really are on the cutting edge of social change here. Uh, But I did reach a certain point, especially after 2016, where it's like, I will be a bridge for people who want to bridge Yet, this is what I stand for. Mm. This is what I stand for. And to cite Lisa Hayes, who runs ICM's BIPOC program, some things are just not up for debate yep. with me. Yep. Especially as, as somebody who really sees anti-oppression endeavors as a critical part of trauma work. And I am still a very deeply faithful person. I have a lot of Catholic Christian identity still in me, although I'm very ecumenical and practice yoga and have a lot of Eastern spiritual threads. And for me, it just uh, all leads to this like greater love of spirit and that fuels my humanity. So I, I, I get faith. I love faith. I really hate what a lot of people do in the name of it. Yes. And that is what uh, I'm trying to play some part in having a role to, to heal and or to change. Hmm. Well, I, I am just so grateful um, for you for so many reasons, but what's, what's hitting me now in my heart is that I know anyone listening to this who's resonating with what, what you're sharing, whether it's about social justice, whether it's about uh, dissociation, whether it's about being able to have permission to say who we really are in a community that feels safe for us. I feel very confident that at least one more person is going to know that there are safe spaces where we can learn and be together in a value system that makes sense for us. So so thank you for creating that because I really don't feel like there are enough spaces like that yet. Mm. In, in the EMDR community, in the mental health community. And I, and I really see you as someone who is creating a model for others to learn from in that way. Thank you. Thank you. And may the work continue. Still got so much work to do. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I would love to have you on again to continue any conversation. I think there's so much we can keep talking about. So you have an open invitation to visit us again anytime. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. And thank you for having me today. Absolutely. I want to again thank Dr. Jamie Merrick for joining us here on the podcast today. Aren't y'all feeling good that there are people out there that are leading us, not just with clinical content, but they are really inviting us to listen in a qualitative way to what we are saying to each other, what our clients are are teaching us, inviting us to learn more about ourselves and our relationship with dissociation and so many other of our parts. And for those of you out there that are thinking about private practice or already have a private practice, I want to lovingly invite you to follow Dr. Merrick's lead and think about if your practice could embody some sort of value system, some sort of social justice mission? What might that look like in a way that feels comfortable for you? Because as we have been talking about here on this Summer of Innovation series, we cannot separate clinical work from ourselves and our own work. We cannot separate clinical work from what is happening around us socially and politically. So I hope this gives you food for thought. 
like I say every time, it is still true. I am so impressed by y'all. I am so grateful. I am so proud to be part of our community. I am so proud for all that we continue to do and all that we continue to learn. And I want to just thank all of you out there who are creating a culture of inclusion and safety and understanding. I see you and I love you and I appreciate you. So until next time, I'm rooting for your success. Be well. Be well.